Mark's Gospel, chapter number 14, verses 3 through 9. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he said it meet, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, ye may do to them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Now let me just say that we have prayed and we have prepared and we are present tonight and the days of this week wanting and desiring a supernatural intervention from God. I mean, I want to see God rent the heavens, open up the windows and pour out heaven sent Holy Ghost revival. I have as you a longing for revival. I came tonight look for revival. I'm talking about that supernatural move of God. But if we're not careful, we get so caught up in our longing for revival and our looking for revival that we neglect that you and I should be living for revival. We have the revival longing. We have the revival looking. But do we have the revival living in Mark's gospel? He introduces her as a woman. John chapter number 12, the apostle John informs us that this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. But this woman in this text is a Bible example of someone who is living for revival or is revival living. See, if you're not revival living, you'll come tonight, nobody will get saved, nobody will rush to the altar, nothing seems to happen, you'll go out with your head down, uh, your lip pooched and you'll think, well, we wasted tonight. But if you're living for revival, you realize that God uh, is always up to something in somebody's life. Life. And if you come looking for something from God, uh, I got news for you. He has something for you. So may we not just be looking for revival and longing for revival, but day in and day out, may we be living for revival. For just a few minutes tonight, I want to preach on that simple thought, revival living. As we go through this text, we'll find first of all the devotion of revival living. Look again at verse number 3. There being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, what's this phrase? As he, Jesus, set at meat. Mary's devotion was an always devotion. There at supper, there's a big crowd uh, having a big time of fellowship. They're not on Sunday morning at the house of God. Uh, they're not at revival meeting. Uh, nobody had to get their favorite group uh, or her favorite evangelist uh, to get up and sing her favorite song. Uh, Mary wasn't just devoted to Christ uh, on uh, church day or revival meeting she was always devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ she was revival living because her devotion was an always devotion didn't matter to her if he was in church or if he was at work or if he is sitting at supper with a big crowd around she was devoted to him I'm going to just say this when you're devoted to him he'll mean more than anybody else he'll mean more than anything else it won't be easy to get you out of the house of God you won't be looking for a reason to miss. Amen. I'm here to tell you that Mary went about her daily life, but her devotion was always toward him. It was always on him. It was always for him. It's not only an always devotion, but we see it was an above devotion. Look at this. She said that she had a 
uh, alabaster box of ointment of spikenard. Watch your Bible. It was very precious. Not just precious. It was very precious. She, her devotion was above price. She takes that box of ointment. She comes to Jesus while he's sitting at me. Oh, watch out, Mary, now. You're about to go too far. You're about to become a fanatic. That's your retirement. That's everything you've got. I'm going to tell you how precious it was. She loved her brother Lazarus, but he lay in that grave four days stinking dead, but he didn't get any of that ointment. Hallelujah. She is saving that for herself. But Jesus was sitting at me and her devotion was always on him and all of a sudden she said I think I'll just give I'm going all in now God help us tonight to get so much into our living for revival that we're willing to go back there to the safe reach back on the back side of our heart let everything be given to him here she comes watch what your Bible said in verse 3 she had an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard very precious and she break the box I mean she's not just longing for revival she's not just looking for revival she's right in the middle of living for it now she's taking everything she's got the most precious thing in her life and she broke the box I'm going to tell you something you can't put the ointment back in after you break the box she can't stop now she done stepped off in the deep end. She done pulled the swimmies off. She done took the little uh, floaties off her arms. Uh, she done got out of the kiddie pool. She's out here in the deep water. There's no turning back from here. There's no going back. Her devotion was above any price. She said, I don't care what it costs. I don't care what I got to give up. I just want him. I just want him. She comes and pours all that ointment on his head. <laughs> she said, I just want him to have it. I don't need it. I don't want it. They sang it tonight and we shouted, but do we really mean it? He's all that I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need anybody else. As one preacher said this week, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's not just been supplying our need. He's been giving us a lot of our wants. I'm not holding anything back. I'm all in. I want my devotion to be above any price. I hear people say, well, I'd be one of them old time Christians like you, but it costs too much. Doesn't cost me anything. Because I have him. I'm going to press on. I'll let the pastor tell you, if he doesn't have your pocketbook, he doesn't have your heart. If you're holding back on anything, you're not all in. You may be longing for revival. You may be looking for revival, but I'm afraid you might miss it when it comes. Amen. Because you're not living for it. Her devotion was above price. It wasn't only just above price. It was above people. Now, I read it to you so I could paraphrase it from Weaver's Country Commentary. Here's what they said. Boy, she wasted that. She wasn't them fanatic Christians. It don't take all that now, Mary. You don't have to do all that. You could have, if you had been a real Christian. You ever notice how people who don't even claim to be a Christian know how Christians are supposed to act? I got a Greek word for what I say about that. Baloney. They don't have any idea what a Christian is supposed to be and a lot of people, folks sitting in the church don't know what a Christian is supposed to be because they ain't never broke their Bible. I don't want shade tree Christianity. I don't want backstreet grandma Christianity. I want Bible Christianity. I don't want this new stuff. I was raised in an old independent fundamental King James Bible only. Walk right, keep it tight, spit white, and drink Sprite. I'm not mad about it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm sure not recovering from it. I like that all in. Christianity. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Mary didn't stop and ask the apostles would it be alright. She didn't ask Simon the leper whose house it was if it'd be alright. She said I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what. How far down the road would you be with God if you'd quit worrying about what they thought about you at work or over at the schoolhouse or members of your family. She said I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody does. I don't 
don't care what anybody thinks. Uh, it's all about him. Uh, I just want him. Uh, you have this world and a thousand more like it. Just give me him. Just give me him. Just give me him. Amen. Care what they think. Well, they might make fun of you. But I'm going to tell you this. I posted something preaching. Man, I was getting one positive like, like. I told my daughter, I said, man, I've got 300 and something likes on this. She said, how many dislikes, thumbs down do you have? Because you ain't really started preaching until you get a couple of those thumbs down. I said, I got two. She said, maybe you preach in that book. Because if you put it out there for everybody to see and everybody likes it and you don't get no, I get a little hate mail every once in a while through Messenger. Hey, hey man, you say, what do you do? I don't even respond. So if you send me something and I don't respond, don't get mad because I don't respond when it's good so they can't talk about me when I don't respond when it's bad. And I want you to like me and I want you to invite me back and I hope God's blessing you through the preaching. But I didn't drive up here because just because of you I, I'm doing it for him I, I don't need some big time evangelist pat me on the head and say you're doing it right keep doing it I'm not doing it for some clique or club I, I'm not doing it for some church I, I'm doing it let them say what they will let them think what they will it doesn't matter I just want him my devotion is to him that is revival living not only do we see it in her devotion, but in verses 6 through 8, we'll see it in her deeds, the things that she did. What's verse number 6 with me? And Jesus said, Now I don't know what you care most about. I don't care much about what people say. I care a whole lot about what Jesus said. Now they're talking with indignation got their nose curled up she's wasting that money God blessed her with that she just going to throw it away and Jesus said let her alone why don't you mind your own business leave her alone watch it now why trouble you her why is it bothering you you didn't buy it you ever notice that Everybody worried about what somebody's doing. God provided it to me. If I want to give it away, what's that to you? If I want to give my whole life to him, what's that to you? Why would you trouble me over that? Hallelujah. He said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? Watch this now. Watch this phrase. This is the phrase. She hath wrought a good work on me. You all caught up in what she going to do for the poor. Judas, you all caught up in how you can embezzle it and get something for you. But she ain't a doing it on the poor. And she ain't a doing it for a crook. Uh, she's working a work on me. I tell you what we see. We see the focus of her deeds. One of the problems with Christianity today is we're trying to impress the world. Uh, we're trying to get the world to uh, pump us up and believe we're Christian. Our works, our deeds uh, should not be wrought on the world. Uh, they ought to be wrought on on him. We ought to do it for him. This Bible said whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. If you preach, preach for the Lord. If you work, work for the Lord. Doesn't matter if you drive a truck, change diapers, sweep a floor, dig ditches, whatever you do, it's the focus ought to be on him. I tell you, it'll make it a lot better in the morning if you'll get up and decide I'm not working for that company. I'm not working for that sorry boss man. I'm not working for that sorry crew they got me stuck with. I'm on drive a truck, dig a ditch, what a stock of shelf, whatever it is, rear up children, change diapers and boil bottles, whatever it may be. I'm on do it for him. Everything I do is because of him. When I graduated high school, I went straight in the United States Navy, Orlando, Florida in the summertime. It's about 147 degrees in the shade. The, the women train down there, I think it's all closed up now, but even the ladies train down there. And on graduation time came, I believe there's four male companies and two female companies graduating on that Friday morning. And uh, uh, what you do is every class you went to, every activity you did, if you scored a certain score, you got a flag. So how many have flags you had, that's how good you were at, at your training. Well... The company I was in, we had the least amount of flags. The girls even had more flags than we did. 
So we got all mess, uh, uh, messed up, ready for passing review. And what they did, they flew down three admirals in a private jet. Admiral of any of you army guys, uh, that's equivalent to a general. It's called an admiral in the Navy. The highest ranking admiral, they put up like an Olympic podium. And the highest ranking admiral stood on the Olympic podium top. And the two lower rankings stood on the side. And we would pass and review. And they said, now as we pass, we'll turn eyes right. We'll salute. How many ever of those admirals salute us, that's how impressed they are with our company. As a squad leader in the first squad, as a man right there at the admiral's when we went out right and hand salute. And when we went for, forward, uh, we might, went by the grandstands where all our friends and family was, made a right hand turn, went in behind the grandstands. Soon as we fell out of formation, they ran up to me and said, Weaver, Weaver, how many of the admirals saluted us? I gave them the redneck answer the first time. I just shrugged my shoulders. They said, whoa, whoa, how many? How many salute us? I said, I don't know. How could you not know? You squad leader, first squad, you were right in front of them. I said, I'll tell you how I don't know. Because when I went eyes right, I didn't see three admirals standing on a podium. But beside that podium, I saw Senior Chief Anthony Luca and Petty Officer First Class Alvarado standing on the ground that I was marching on. Those were the two men that took a no account Mill Hill boy, redneck, and turned him into a sailor. They got up 3.30 every morning and woke me up. They stood in the hot sun, marched me on that grinder, showed me what, how to fold this, how to tie that, and they made me what I was that day. I don't care what three guys flew down on a private jet, hadn't spent a day in the Florida sun, I, I hadn't made an investment in my life. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not caught up in what other evangelists think about me or what other churches or cliques think about me. i tell you what I'm caught up in. I'm caught up in Him that left heaven and came down, got down on the same ground that I walk on, the same place where I live, got right down with me. I'm not worried about some highfalutin preacher. I'm worried about Him who came to where I was and took me from my sin pit and made me what I ought to be. My focus is not on you. My focus is not on them. I'm focused on him. The focus of her deeds. She wrought a good work on me, Jesus said. Do it for him. Verse number seven. He tells them that the poor with them always. Whenever you want to, you can help the poor. Verse 8, what's this phrase? She hath done what she could. Not only do I see the focus of her deeds, I see the fullness of her deeds. She didn't try to be somebody else. She wasn't trying to be somebody that she was not. Neither did she try to do something that she was not able to do. Let me go ahead and say this so I prick you just a little bit. Every worry and every message lately, I've tried to find a little place not to cut you, not to slice you open, but just prick you a little bit. She wasn't complaining about what she didn't have. <laughs> she wasn't saying, well, if God had made me a man and called me to be one of the apostles... If the church was sitting down there on the main highway, if we had a little bit more money, she wasn't complaining about what she didn't have. She wasn't grumbling about what talent she didn't have. She just said, this is who I am. This is what I can do. And I'll just give everything. I'll just do what I can. I'll give it everything I got. I'll be the best at what I can do. Now, my daddy was not a spiritual man. He wasn't saved about the last two and a half years of his life. He used to tell me this. This was his favorite illustration. He'd say, son, if you grow up and become a ditch digger, you be the best ditch digger the man's got. Never be satisfied until you're the best ditch digger around. If you go to, go to another job, you want your boss man to say, oh, no, I don't want to lose him. Uh, he's the best ditch digger I got. 
Well, there ain't nothing important about digging a ditch. Don't worry about that. He said, what you want to hear him say is, you ever saw that weaver boy dig a ditch? You ain't never seen how he can dig a ditch. And what she said was, I may not be able to preach. I don't have any prominence in the community. I don't have any money to give. But the one thing I can do, I can take that ointment that I've been saving up. I can take that one thing that God blessed me with. Uh, and they may be feeding their face. They don't realize who he is. Is, uh, but I'm going all the way uh, I'm giving everything I got uh, I'm doing the best I can with what I have right where I am uh, for his glory she was going all out I'm here to tell you to do less than your best is a sin how much more sin would it be to do the be less than your best for the one that loved you and died for you and saved you by his good grace I say that we ought to be all in uh, but we ought to give it all that we have. The fullness. She did what she could. Now, I'm not a singer. So you don't have me get up trying to sing songs. I can't build anything. I can't fix anything. If a lamp or something goes out the house, I hand it to my wife and say, if you can't fix this, I'll go buy us another one. I have no gifts or talents. Matter of fact, I make a joke. I even say I can't sing or dance. So if his preaching thing don't work out, my wife has to keep us up, I reckon, because I got too old to work like I used to do. But you know what I'm going to do? Every time the mantle falls on me, I'm going to study my Bible and pray. I'm going to be full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I, might, I might not impress you. I might not be the best you heard. Uh, but I'm going to give it everything I got. Uh, I'm not leaving a stone unturned. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can every time. I'm going full out. I'm giving it all I got. This is the best I got. Uh, and I'm giving it all. And I'm doing it for him the focus of our deeds the fullness of our deeds watch this phrase at the end of verse number 8 she have done what she could here it is she has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burial this ain't an intimate gathering all the disciples were Jesus there's a big crowd this is a big if you will church wide fellowship and Mary the most insignificant person there is the smartest person in the room. Jesus said, I got to go away. I'm going to die. Peter grabbed him and said, you ain't going to die. Peter was in the inner circle. Had been the fathers with Jesus. Spent the most time intimately with Jesus. Didn't know why Jesus had to die. Thomas was saying, if you're going the way, show us the way. How we know the way? We don't know the way. We don't know what's going on. Mary said, I know what's going to happen. I know who he is. I know they're going to kill him. I don't know when she figured it out. But she figured it out. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just a healer. There's more to him. She finally found out who he really was. And Jesus said, she's poured this on me to anoint my body a four time. She's come days before they kill me to anoint me for the burial. She knows who I am. She knows. Listen, when they made fun of her, this is the faith of her deeds. She just did it in faith. She just believed. When they told her, no, he ain't going to die. She believed he is going to die. When they said he's been dead too long, uh, she believed he's going to resurrect. When Lazarus was four days stinking dead, she just believed. When Martha scolded her and said, get in this kitchen and get away from Jesus, she just believed. When gas went over four dollars a gallon and the Russians invaded uh, uh, Ukraine and th threatened a nuclear attack, Mary just believed. She said, I don't care what's going on around me. I know who he is. I've invested everything in him. God help us get back to just believing. Pastor and I was talking about it today. I'm going to tell you where the most of church folks are. I'm talking about good, born again, blood washed church folks are. They say, I know he can. I know God can. And he might. Not Mary. Mary said, I know he is, and I know he will. 
When they make fun of him, he will. When they, don't, when they don't know, he will. Smartest person in the room. She wasn't hoping so, thinking so, maybe so. She was believing with all her heart. I mean, her faith was above everybody else in the room. God help us. We may not be able to preach. We may not be able to sing. We may not have a lot of money to give, but we can put our trust in him. We can believe God. I was preaching somewhere and I said one night I said the only thing God ever asked anybody in this Bible to do was believe him and somebody come up and said preacher I have a problem with that young preacher I believe it was and I said why do you have a problem with it he said well they asked Noah to build an ark I said you need to read the whole Bible he didn't ask Noah to build an ark he came to Noah because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He came to Noah and said, I'm sick of man. I'm going to send a flood out of the sky. Now, you might not agree with this, but he said, I'm going to send a flood out of the sky. It ain't never been nothing but blue. Never had a cloud in it. A mist went up from the earth. It didn't rain back then. A mist come up and watered the earth. They had never seen rain. Never, I don't believe, heard thunder or seen lightning. They would never seen a deluge of water. But he told uh, uh, Noah, I'm sick of man. I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to flood this whole world uh, and drown everybody. Do you believe me? Noah said, yes, sir, I believe you. He said, well, if you believe me, what you better do? You better build a boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet higher. You're going to drown with the rest of them. Because if I go over there and pull up dust and breathe in its nostrils one time, it won't hurt me to do it again. I won't have any problem with it. And Noah, the Bible said in the New Testament, here's what the Bible said, and Noah moved with fear. He believed God meant what he said, and it scared him. He told his wife, I got to build a boat or we all going to drown. And he moved with fear, built an ark, you know what it says, to the saving of his household. That means if you hadn't have built that ark, if you hadn't believed God, he would have died with the rest of the world. And Mary would have been a nervous wreck for three days and three nights while he lay in the tomb. But I can almost hear her say, if he raised my brother up who's stinking dead four days I just believe he's going to get up I just believe he's going to let come what may let the devil roar like a lion let hell come in like a flood God said he'd see us all the way through that he'd go all the way I just believe God meant what he said when he said what he did you say what we all do preach we all just get back to believing just believe We've been through some hard times at my house. I mean, so I know I look around, I can tell how y'all dress. Y'all ain't never been there, but we've been where if it cost a quarter to get from South Carolina to New York City, we didn't have enough money to get out of sight. I'm telling I'm going to go ahead and tell you. I pulled the cushions off the couch before to hunt enough chains to go to the store and get a, a loaf of bread. Because down out where I'm from, we call it a loaf. A loaf of bread. It's been rough. Sometime them rough times have come in. Me and my wife be talking one or the other, and not one of us will say to the other, Well, what are we going to do now? I mean, we ain't got no way to pay it. Ain't got no way to go. And too, uh, too still, too proud to beg. Ain't going to call nobody and ask them, What are we going to do? And the other one will say, Well, I guess we'll do what we always do. We'll just believe God. Now, I ain't going to stand any longer and tell you. But I've tried a lot of things. I've worked two jobs and pastor churches. I've run over here and worked half a day, go over there and work half a day and then work all night, run here, run there, and try to make it. But when I finally got to the point where I said, I think I'll just believe God. I'll just put it in his hand and let the chips fall where they may. It's almost like God said, well, thank you. If you'll get out of my way, I'll show you what I can really do. I don't know about you. You can doubt all you want to. You can quit all you want to. But as for me and my house, we just believe God let them say what they will our faith has found a resting place not in device nor creed it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me I just believe God I believe God I believe God revival living seen in her devotion seen in her deeds I give you this in verse 9 I'm finished seen in her dependence watch this in verse 9 verily that word basically means truly or amen. Jesus got excited and said, Amen. Verily, I say unto you. 
Now, watch it with me now. Where, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the... You got to be kidding me. Does your Bible say whole world? They didn't even know back then what the whole world was. Mary is in somebody else's house in a little town outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. And Jesus stood up and said, she ain't got nothing. I'm paraphrasing because Weaver's commentary, country commentary. She ain't got nothing. She's nobody. She's insignificant. Nobody really cares about her. Nowhere do you see anybody phoning over or showing her any love or appreciation. But he said, I want you to know this. This woman's just wroughting a good work on me. She's just revival living and she's going to put her dependence on me about how far it'll reach. You want to reach your family? I got a boy all the way out in Louisiana. You want to reach him? Put it on Jesus. Because if Jesus can say in Bethany 2,000 years ago, wheresoever in the... Does it say the whole world? They didn't even know what the whole world... But the fact, Paul said, I can't wait to get out of prisons so I can take the gospel to the regions beyond. They knew something was out there, but they didn't know what was out there. And Mary said, I'll just uh, devote myself to him. I'll just give all to him. I'll just believe on him. And I'll let him worry about how it's going to reach and where it's going to go. Hallelujah, if you'd revival live, ain't no telling where God would take it, especially in our day with Facebook and YouTube and all of those things to send the gospel out. No telling what God would do. When I was pastor blessed Hope Baptist Church, I don't drink coffee. I'm a Coca-Cola. I'm a soda man. And uh, I never did like to drink out of a can. But scrap was real high. Aluminum was real high at the scrap yard. So I quit drinking out of bottles and started buying them in cans. Then I'd mash the cans. When I'd get a big set of cans, I'd take them down to recycling, and I'd recycle them. And I'd send Bibles all over the world. But I had some bags sitting out on, I lived on, on the property, just like come up that driveway, my house sat right on the side of the driveway, church's house. And they come by, and I had big black trash bags sitting on the porch. And they said, Preacher, you need us to help you take that trash off? I said, That ain't trash. They said, Well, what's in them bags? I said, mashed up aluminum cans. I used to mash them with my hands. One of my welding members welds for a living. He made me little things so I could set them up and just mash them like that. But I said, they cans. They said, what do you do with those cans? I said, I take them down to recycling. I send uh, Bibles all over the world. My pastor did it and it caught on with me and me and my wife's always done it. And I send Bibles all over the world. Well, I took those uh, little Walmart bag one time, put it inside the pulpit. I was in a big way and I got out and I pulled that bag out with them cans, mashed up can, I shook it. I said, what do y'all hear? They said, a bunch of aluminum cans rattling. I said, well, that ain't what I hear. I'd blow them cans up. Sometimes I'd do it on Wednesday when people say, what are you doing? I said, I'm going in the morning and turn them cans into Bibles. They finally caught on. I'd reach down in there and pull that bag out and I'd say, what do y'all hear? They said, we hear Bibles rattling in that bag. Every once in a while you get a letter come from Africa, Honduras, somewhere I've never been. And they'd say, we got a Bible from you. And here's the names of everybody that's reading that Bible. And I used to tell the church, one of these days you'll be in heaven. I don't know what all heaven is, but I'm telling it the way I believe it. Somebody will walk up to you and poke you on the shoulder. We'd, we'd give up our Friday night eating to send Bibles. I said, somebody will poke you on the shoulder and say, you remember that Friday night you said I'll give my going out family Friday night meal money and send them Bibles yeah so the Lord told me to come over here and tell you when you sent those Bibles I got that Bible and I read it and got saved then I read it to my wife she got saved we read it to our kids and they got saved I said it'd be worth missing that meal then won't it It'd be worth it because only God knows. Right. When you give it, don't worry about you putting a mission offering. Don't worry about where it's going. Right. God knows how to take it and make it reach. He said, and I'm moving on, the whole world. When they didn't even know what the, I'm not sure we know what the whole world is, but I know they didn't know. Right. 
but she was depending on him to make it reach where it needed to go. Watch this, and I'm done. It said, Wheresoever this gospel is preached throughout the whole world, this also shall that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. You gotta be kidding me. Not Peter, not Paul, not James or John, but Mary. We don't hardly know anything about Mary. And they go anywhere the gospel's preached throughout the whole world. Jesus made this statement 2,000 years ago before there was a United States, before there was a Florence, Kentucky. And I just spent 33 minutes trying to tell you what Jesus said that I'd tell you every time the gospel was preached throughout the whole world. They'd mark it. They'd remember what she did. It would be an example to us and a memorial for her. Didn't have a lot of money. Didn't have a lot of talent. Didn't do a whole lot. But she wrought a good work on him. And it's reached all the way to Florence, Kentucky. She's been dead some 2,000 years. And I've worked up a sweat trying to tell you what she did. I'm talking about the power of revival living. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But what will they say when Sidney Weaver's gone? If the coming of the Lord's not when we think it is in our lifetime and he waits another 200 years, what will they remember about you? Then 2,000. And I'm going to just go ahead and tell you this. This thing's settled forever in heaven. It won't never be forgotten what she did. I don't know about you. You can sit around long for it and look for it and forget to live for it. But by the good grace of God tonight, I'm going to live for revival. Grant it to be so. God, help us in Jesus' name. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of the word and the power of the Holy Ghost. May we not just leave here looking for revival and longing for revival, but may we every day live for revival. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.